So in the last video, I spent a lot of time on this example where we're modeling position as a function of time. The situation that I gave was a hiking example. So I guess this is me hiking and keeping track of how far I go after a certain amount of hours. And I spent a lot of this video talking about something that I really couldn't answer, talking about instantaneous speed. I left you with the question of whether I'm walking faster one hour into my hike than I am eight hours into my hike based just on this graph. And I argued that the answer was in fact yes, but we didn't really have enough knowledge or tools to explain why the answer is yes. The big takeaway was supposed to be that instantaneous speed, speed at a given instant, is really, really hard in math. That's the bad news. But I got some good news. There's a related question that is not really hard. Average speed. That's something we have all the tools to answer. If somebody asked you what my average speed was for the first hour, all you'd have to do is come up here and be like, well, in one hour, we traveled six miles, so I guess your average speed was six miles per hour. That's it. What is my average speed for the first hour? It's just six miles per hour. And it's not just the first hour that we can do this analysis for. I could ask about the average speed from hour three to hour seven. And we come up here and be like, well, let's see, at the start at hour three, we were 12 miles into our hike. And at the end at hour seven, we were 18 miles into our hike. So it looks like we went a distance of six miles, but it took us four hours to do that. We traveled six miles in four hours. It looks like our speed was 1.5 miles per hour. All right, six fourths is the same as three halves, which is one and a half. The takeaway is supposed to be that average speed is not that hard to figure out. All we have to do to figure that out is calculate the change in position and divide that by the change in time. In this first hour, my position went from position zero to position six. So my change in position was six minus zero. How much time did it take me to do that? Well, at the start I was at time zero, at the end I was in time one. So the change in time is just one minus zero. I know we didn't have to actually do this calculation. We could just see that it was six miles per hour, but maybe having something a little bit more formulaic will be beneficial when we get to slightly harder examples. If you struggled to figure out why the average speed from hour three to hour seven was one and a half miles, all we'd have to do is kind of use this formula right here. At hour three, our position was 12 miles into our hike. At hour seven, our position was 18 miles into our hike. Between these two points, the position changed by whatever 18 minus 12 is equal to. That's the six miles. And how long did it take us to do that? Well, if we went from hour three to hour seven, the change in time is seven minus three or four. Average speed is really nice because it has a formula that's kind of intuitive and makes sense. And it's a formula that's not that hard to use. And all we're gonna do in this video is kind of generalize that a little bit. Sometimes we wanna know not about average speed, Maybe about the average change in a function, because maybe our function isn't modeling the position of a hiker. Maybe it's modeling something else. That's totally fine. We're gonna do the exact same thing. We're just gonna call it the average rate of change. So for example, say I gave you this function right here. Maybe we'll call it f of x. What does it model? I have no idea, but it doesn't matter at all. Suppose somebody asked you to calculate the average rate of change of this function from x equals negative two to x equals three. What would you do? Well, first you can locate negative two on your graph and recognize that that point has a y coordinate of eight. And then you can locate positive three on your graph and recognize that that point has a y coordinate of negative two. The average rate of change is just asking how much the y coordinate changes by divided by how much the x coordinate changes by. Since the y coordinate is the output of the function, we can write it as f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by x2 minus x1. Difference in the outputs divided by difference in the inputs. We're given two x values. We arbitrarily name them x1 and x2. It doesn't matter which one you call which. Once we have the two x values, we can figure out the two f of x values. f of x1 is just asking what comes out of this machine f when I put x1 into it. X1 is the number negative two, so F of X1 is just asking me what is F of negative two? What comes out when you put negative two in? Because of this point, eight comes out when you put negative two in. So F of X1 is equal to eight. Similarly, if I needed to know what F of X2 were equal to, I just need to know what X2 is equal to. X2 is the number three, so F of X2 is just asking me what is F of three? What comes out of this machine when I put three into it? Because of this point, what comes out is the number negative two. So f of x two is negative two. 
I now have all the pieces that I need for this formula, right? There's four different things that go into this formula, x1, x2, f of x1, f of x2. If I'm given two different x values, I can arbitrarily call them x1 and x2, and I have two of the four things already. And then figuring out the remaining two is as easy as evaluating inputs and outputs for functions. So as long as the previous section made sense to you, this really is nothing new. f of x2 is negative two. From that, I wanna subtract f of x1, which is the number eight. I wanna divide that by x2, which is three, minus x1, which is negative two. Negative two minus eight is negative 10. Three minus negative two is the same as three plus two, which is five and negative 10 fifths is the same as negative two. The average rate of change of this function from x1 equals negative two to x2 equals three is just negative two. Before we move on to a second example to kind of test whether this all made sense to you, I wanna make one more point about what we just figured out here. What we did is we took the difference in the y coordinates and divided it by the difference in the x coordinates. If that little phrase rings a bell, that's exactly what we talked about when we were talking about linear equations. We defined that. That thing has a name. The difference in the y divided by the difference in the x, sometimes referred to as rise over run, that's just the slope of a straight line. So really when we calculate average rate of change, all we're doing is we're calculating the slope of the line that connects two different points on a graph. This line that we just drew in orange connecting these two points goes down two units each time it goes to the right one unit. I know that's a little bit hard to see because of how the axes are scaled, but remember on the y-axis we're scaled in terms of fives and on the x-axis we're scaled in terms of one. So this really represents two units and this represents one unit. A really, really important fact is to recognize that the average rate of change of a function is really just the slope of the line connecting the two points that are given. That line is what's called the secant line. And that's an interesting enough observation that we can go back up here to the example from the previous video and connect some points to calculate some average rates of change. Here's the secant line passing through the points 0, 0, and 1, 6. The slope of this secant line represents the average rate of change of this function from x equals 0 to x equals 1. When the function models position, the average rate of change just tells you the average speed. If you look at the slope of this line in orange, it goes up 6 units each time it goes right 1 unit. This slope is six, this average speed is six, I'm walking six miles per hour on average over the first hour. If we wanna know our average speed over the next six miles from time one to time three, all we have to do is calculate the slope of the secant line passing through this point in purple and this point in pink. The slope of this line in green. Just looking at it, we can tell it's not as steep as this line in orange, so what that means is our average speed will be less over this second six mile interval than it was over this first six mile interval. And we can calculate exactly what it is. We go up by six units each time we go to the right by two units. Six divided by two is three. Our average speed over this second interval is three miles per hour. Finally, our last six mile interval from time three to time seven, you wanna know what the average speed is? Just calculate the slope of the secant line that passes between those two points. Looks like we go up six units each time we go to the right by four units. Six divided by four or three halves or one and a half represents the average rate of change of this function from x equals three to x equals seven. And because our function models position, that tells us that our average speed over that time is three halves or one and a half miles per hour. This might be a good time to pause and see if you're picking this up well on your own. Can you calculate the average rate of change of this function f that's given by this graph from x equals five to x equals six? If you feel like it, give it a shot. All you'd have to do is recognize that when x equals five, we're at this point right here that has a y coordinate of eight. And when x equals six, we're at this point way up here that has a y coordinate of 16. You don't have to draw the secant line, but it might help, especially for like the visual learner out there. This line in red has a slope of, well, let's see, what's the rise? I went, I rose from eight all the way up to 16. So it looks like I went up by eight units. What's the run? How much did I go to the right? Well, I went from five to six, that's just one unit. The slope of this line given in red is eight. What that means is the average rate of change of this function from x equals five to x equals six should just be eight. And it is just eight. And if you're really the formulaic type, you might figure it out by saying, I have this fancy formula for the average rate of change. It's always f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by 
x2 minus x1. And that might seem different from what we did up here, but really it's the exact same thing because the output for the function is just the y-coordinate and the change in the y-coordinates is really just giving you this rise. Don't believe me? Arbitrarily call these guys x1 and x2. Figure out f of x1 and f of x2. f of x1 is just gonna be what comes out of this machine when I put x1, in other words, five into it. When I put five into the machine, because of this point, eight comes out of it. So f of x1 is just eight. f of x2 is just asking me what comes out of this machine when I put x2 or six into it. Because of this point way up here, what comes out of the machine when I put six in is the number 16. So f of x2 is just 16. I now have all four of the pieces that I need to calculate average rate of change. And we again see that the average rate of change is 16 minus eight divided by six minus five. In other words, eight over one or just eight. Before I end this video, I wanna do three more examples and that might seem like a lot, but really it won't be because I think we'll be able to fly through them pretty quickly if you understand this formula here. Note I said understand instead of memorize. You can memorize it if you want, but I really feel like this is one you don't have to memorize if you're making the connection between average rate of change and slope of the secant line. I'd argue you already know this formula. It's just rise over run written in fancy mathematical jargon, but memorize it if you want. The point that I wanna make in the next three examples is just that you don't need the graphs to do any of this stuff. You can do all of this purely algebraically. If I gave you this function right here and I ask you to calculate the average rate of change on this interval from negative two to three. This is a slightly different way of wording the problem, but really all we're saying here is that x1 is negative two and x2 is positive three. You're always gonna be given the two different x values. All you have to do is figure out the two different y values. What comes out of this machine if you put these values into the machine? Well, the name of this machine is g of x, so I'd need to figure out g of x1. x1 is the number negative two, so I'd need to figure out what comes out of this machine when I put negative two into it. This blueprint tells me what comes out of the machine when I put anything I want into it. All I gotta do is change all the x's into negative twos. I get negative two squared minus three times negative two minus two more. Let's see, positive four plus six gives me 10 minus two. That leaves me with eight. Do the same thing for g of x2, where now I'm putting the number three into this machine. What would come out would be three squared minus three times three minus two. Let's see, that's nine minus nine, which is zero minus two. That leaves me with negative two. Now I can figure out the average rate of change because I have all four pieces that go into this formula. I guess my average rate of change of a function g would be g of x2 minus g of x1 divided by x2 minus x1. It's a lot if you're just memorizing it, but if you understand, I'm really just looking for the slope and I'm thinking y coordinates here and x coordinates here, it's really easy. How much does this graph go up by when it goes from x1 to x2? Well, it goes from eight to negative two. So it goes up by negative 10 units. I can see that by taking negative two and subtracting eight, taking g of x2 and subtracting g of x1. How much does it run by? How much does it go over by? Well, it goes from negative two to three. So it sounds like it goes over to the right by five units. I can get that by doing three minus negative two. Negative two minus eight is negative 10. Three minus negative two is five. And so I get negative 10 over five. In other words, negative two is my answer. These numbers might feel a little bit familiar. The reason they feel familiar is this function right here is the equation of this graph right here. So all of my x's and f of x's line up exactly in this blue example and this green example down here. Let me do one more example because I wanna make a point and then I'll leave you with a couple to just practice on on your own. Here's another function f of x equals two thirds x minus four. Don't worry at all about what type of function this is or what the graph looks like. Let's do this completely algebraically the first time around. What we're being asked is to calculate the average rate of change on this interval from three to nine. This is always telling us the x values. So from this notation, we know that x1 is equal to three and that x2 is equal to nine. In our back pocket, we have this average rate of change formula, which tells us the average rate of change is just f of x2 minus f of x1 divided by x2 minus x1. Again, the rise divided by the run. Since we have x1 and x2, and we have an equation of the function f, it's easy to figure out f of x1. All we gotta do is put three into this machine and see what comes out. Let's see, two thirds times three, I gotta deal with fractions, but that's okay. Two thirds of three is just two. And two minus four, 
That gives me negative two. I guess I could write that out. What about f of x2, the last piece we need? Well, that would just be f of nine because x2 is equal to nine. Put nine into this machine and figure out what comes out. It'd be two thirds times nine minus four. Two thirds of nine, we can think about this as 18 thirds, which is just six. And six minus four leaves us with positive two. Let's calculate the average rate of change. f of x2 was two minus f of x1, which is negative two. Be really careful when you're subtracting the negative numbers in here. Divided by x2, which is nine, minus x1, which is three. I get four divided by six, I get two thirds as my answer. You're like, yeah, whatever, you get some answer, I don't care what it is, you beat this to death, I understand how to do this. Well, slow down for a minute. This answer is actually kind of interesting. I argue that we could get this answer without doing any calculations at all if we were really clever. Go back and look at this function. Do you recognize what type of function this is? Remember in the first review section, we talked about linear equations. This is in the form y equals mx plus b, where b is negative four and m is two thirds. We don't need to know the graph of this function to calculate this answer, but I can tell you that it has a y-intercept at negative four, so somewhere down here, and then it has a slope of two thirds. So I go up two units each time I go to the right three units. I can do that one more time, go up two units, write three more units. I connect these points and I have a kind of ugly version of this graph, f of x. What I'm being asked to do is find the average rate of change from three to nine. So let's see, here's where x equals three and x equals nine, I don't know, somewhere out here maybe. What I'm trying to do is figure out the slope of the line connecting these two big red dots. But because this function is a linear function, the slope of the line connecting these two dots is just the slope of the linear function. What I'm saying is anytime you're being asked to find the average rate of change of a linear function, you don't even need to do the problem. The answer will just be the slope of that line. It's no coincidence that we calculated two thirds here and we're given two thirds here. If we were really clever, we could have completely ignored the x values that were given because they don't matter. The average rate of change of a linear function for any x values is always going to be the slope of the function and that's because the average rate of change is just the slope of the secant line connecting the points. And the secant line connecting points on a straight line is always gonna be the straight line. If I lost you with this red example, it's really not that big of a deal. That's more kind of expert level. At this point in the class, I just want you to be able to calculate this two thirds by going through these steps. You don't need to see why and how it's equal to this two thirds up here. But if you do make that connection, that's really impressive. I'm getting tired of talking. So what I'm gonna do is burn through these last two examples kind of silently. So if you want, you can pause the video and work them out on your own and just make sure you get the same answer that I get.